Okay, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this Retina UK information uh, webinar. This is one of a series of webinars we'll be hosting, and we'll be delivering at least one on a different topic each month. We are really pleased to have with us today Professor Dominic Fitch. Uh, Professor Fitch joined the Department of Old Age Psychiatry at King's College London in 2006. He is a Professor of Visual Psychiatry and the lead consultant psychiatrist to the Visual Perceptual Disorder Clinic at the South London and Morsley NHS Foundation Trust. He plays a leading role in patient and public education for Charles Bonnet syndrome uh, as a medical advisor to Esme's Umbrella uh, and has helped develop information resources on visual hallucinations for the NHS, the charity sector and eye health professionals. We're also joined today by Denise Rawdon, one of our information and support managers, and she'll be collecting questions throughout the presentation. There are a couple of ways for you to ask questions. You can either type it in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screens. These questions will be asked by the team on your behalf. Alternatively, you can raise your hand by pressing the Alt and Y key if you're on a Windows computer, or Option and Y if you're using a Mac. For those who are using tablet devices, you can raise your hand through the reactions section on your screen. Uh, what we'll then do is ask you to unmute your microphone so you can ask your question in person. So there's a couple of ways to do that. So please leave your questions throughout the presentation and we will um, answer as many as we possibly can at the end. If we're not able to answer all of, your, all of the questions, um, we will um, be following them up over the next couple of weeks. So once again, thank you for joining. And uh, without further ado, I'm delighted to uh, introduce Professor Dominic Fitch. So uh, thank you, uh, Matthew. Thank you, Retina UK. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I like these evening ones because I imagine you all out there with your gin and tonics uh, sipping away and, and uh, uh, listening to me. Um, now, I speak at many uh, visual impairment events and there's a golden rule, which is you, don't, you never show slides. Um, and of course, it's all changed now with our uh, Zoom events and, and uh, these opportunities that we have to do uh, these, these virtual webinars and things. Uh, so I am going to take uh, the opportunity to show some of my favorite images, but, but I want you to rest assured that I, I realize that there will be people in the audience uh, with visual impairment who are gonna struggle to see the slides, but I'm gonna try and paint a, a picture for you using words so that you don't have to struggle to look at the, the slides and you can just uh, sit back and listen to the content. So my talk today is entitled Charles Bonnet Syndrome. I'm, I'm hoping that if you've registered, you vaguely know what that is. But in case you've joined by mistake or you're not entirely sure, I'll just explain what we mean by Charles Bonnet Syndrome. So we start with the idea that you can see things that are not actually there. So that's what we mean by a visual hallucination. And there are actually lots of different causes of this. And one of the causes, causes happens to be eye disease. And for reasons that I'm going to show you, this is, this is the cause that we term the Charles Bonnet syndrome. So visual hallucinations caused by eye disease. And for those of you that can see the screen, uh, we've got some pictures of the man himself um, and different eras of his life. What I really wanted to show was him in, in very young, uh, in his youth or his teenagers, because that's when he becomes something of a childhood prodigy and a, a sort of scientist that, that's known throughout Europe for his work on insects and uh, photosynthesis. Uh, and he carries on in this vein until his mid thirties when unfortunately he's unable to use a microscope anymore um, and so has to turn to uh, other types of science. And he chooses um, what I guess today we would call um, early psychology or philosophy. And in 1760, he writes uh, what I'm reading out here, for those of you that can't see it, it's in French, but I'm translating it, I'm sort of pigeon Frenching it. Um, it's the analytical essay on the faculties 
of the soul, as he writes it. Um, but in fact, what, what Bonnet means, and if you read the treatise today, it's really a very early theory about how the brain works. And Bonnet, because of his science training, he knows all about uh, brain cells, and he has a rudimentary idea uh, in 1760 about how these brain cells might work. Um, and so he's trying to work out actually how that the brain can, can uh, perceive all its uh, wonderful senses, how, how all our human faculties are, are um, captured in the brain. And because he's a religious man, he's a Calvinist, he wants to understand how man or the brain can understand God. That's his ultimate aim. Uh, and within his treatise, there's a, a single chapter where he's trying to illustrate how we can see things. And of course, this is all armchair philosoph philosoph philosophizing. And uh, he wants to illustrate that with some evidence. So he comes up with a description. And again, I'm reading here from the French. Um, and uh, what he's describing is uh, in, in this edition, it's an anonymous man's experiences. So he doesn't name this person but we later find out that it's his grandfather, a, a Genevan magistrate called Charles Lulin. And so Bonnet writes about Lulin. Uh, I'd like to tell you uh, uh, about a man, a respectable man I know who um, in full health, candor and judgment and memory, who when fully awake and independently of everything in front of him sees from time to time figures of men, women, birds, and uh, voiture. Now, the more learned amongst you will know that uh, voiture is French for car, but in 1760, there are no cars in France. Uh, so what we're really talking about here is carriages. Um, there's also buildings, and he talks about seeing the exterior construction of buildings, uh, which he means brickwork and scaffolding patterns. And uh, later on on this page, I haven't highlighted it, um, he, he tells us that this man had had cataract operations. And again, in 1760, that might have been quite a gruesome thing, poking uh, the, the lens out of the way of the needle, or it might have been a sort of more modern, uh, uh, what we would recognise an operation today. Um, but the operation had been a great success, and uh, this man had been able to see again, but, but his vision subsequently deteriorates, and it's in this context of deteriorated vision that uh, he has hallucinations. And it's for this description, actually, just this, these two pages, um, that in the 1930s, it was decided to honor Charles Bonnet with this description of Charles Bonnet syndrome or this eponym of Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now we know a little bit more about Lulin, the grandfather, because his diaries survived. And I, I've got here a timeline of um, what happened to him. So in his left eye, had a cataract operation in 1753. And as I said, great success, able to read with glasses afterwards. Uh, and then a few years later, the vision deteriorates in that eye and he's left with perception of light only. Um, and uh, aged, I should have said he was aged 84 when he had his first cataract operation. Um, and then his right eye, a little bit later, the deterioration starts and he has the cataract operation um, aged uh, 88, I think. Um, and then, as the vision is deteriorating again, that's when the hallucinations occur in 1758. And the year after, around that time, uh, Bonnet encourages his grandfather to make a diary, to record these um, events, because Bonnet at the time is, come, is, is writing his analytical essay and he realizes the importance of his grandfather's experiences and, and asks him to document them so he can use them in his uh, analytical essay. So that's published in 1760, and unfortunately, his grandfather dies um, uh, in 1761, a year after publication, at the ripe old age of 92. Now, in the diaries, we find out a little bit more detail about these um, birds and men and women. So the women are described as wearing very elaborate, beautiful silk costumes. Now, the costumes described would have been contemporary dress for Lulian, 1760 kind of period costume. But of course, I will come back to this later. Um, today, it's not the usual form of um, clothes that you get. And the, the, he, he makes a note that sometimes they were wearing something unusual on their heads. 
and uh, there's an inverted table and, and a casket in, in um, or a chest in one person. Um, the, the, the birds were giant pigeons and the carriages um, are described as growing to monstrous proportions. And I'll show you what, what we mean by that in, in a, 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 com a coming slide. There's also a, um, a weaving machine that um, is like, uh, what well, I, I suppose would be the Swiss version of a spinning jenny. And lots of um, religious pictures in golden frames on, on his walls. Now, I'm, I made a pilgrimage to Geneva where, where um, Bonnet lived all his life actually, and where Lulin was. And, and I've been to the street where he lived. And so this is, for those of you that can see my, my sort of holiday snap here, um, this is the, the very street and the view that Lulin had from his apartment. Now, I couldn't get into the house itself. So this is a, a sort of a, um, a street floor view. So you can imagine Lulin's a little bit higher up looking down at the street. And for those of you that can see um, the slide, on the left here is a house. And so the carriage drives along and grows to the proportions of this house. And that's why Lulin uh, described it as a giant carriage. Now, at the end of the street, you can see this, um, there's a pillar here, which is a fountain. Same, exactly the same uh, fountain that Lulin would have seen. And here it is in, in a slightly larger view. So Lulin describes coming out of this fountain, a procession of people in uh, uh, hooded cloaks. So they've got these gray hooded cloaks marching in a line out of the fountain. Now, those are the sort of exciting things that Bonnet chose to mention in his account, but actually most of the time Lulin was seeing rather boring things. Uh, he was seeing brickwork, he was seeing clover patterns over all his furniture, um, little dots flying around uh, the room um, and sh rudimentary shapes, circles and, and rectangles, and a handkerchief, a handkerchief with golden medallion patterns in, in its corners apparently. So that is Lulin's description and the amazing thing is that you can go to any eye clinic in the world today and you will find people describing exactly that same variety of things and we're going to talk a little bit more about that now in, in more detail. Um, this is these are a, a prevalence figures um, from um, uh, estimated in, in the UK and so we think that between about a 10 to 20% of people with moderate visual loss are at risk of having Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now, what do I mean by moderate risk visual loss? So if you're going to your um, eye checkup and you can't read below halfway down the chart, then you've got a 10 to 20% risk of having Charles Bonnet syndrome. Uh, there is some evidence that if your vision is worse than that, so if you, if you can only read the top letter or perhaps um, not the chart at all, then you may be up to 50% risk of um, Charles Bonnet syndrome. And if we work out how many people have visual impairment of this degree in the UK, we can approximately work out the numbers. So now this, these are numbers taken from the commonest cause of uh, blindness in the UK, which is age-related macular disease. So that's not a, uh, an inherited retinal dystrophy, as I'm sure many of you will know. Um, but this is the commonest cause. And we think that from that disease alone, there are between 70,000 and 420,000 people uh, with Charles Bonnet syndrome. And then, of course, you can add on to that other things, uh, glaucoma, um, or the, the inherited retinal problems, cataracts, everything together. Um, and, and the number will go up. But we don't, to be honest, we don't really know what that number is. But it's going to be something in that ballpark and probably um, much higher than that as for reasons that will become clear. Now I thought for this talk I, I better um, make it a little bit more relevant to uh, Retina UK. So the good, the good news for you is that there's starting now to be research in inherited retinal problems and this is a, a group in the Netherlands who have just done a, a study of, of Stargardt's um, and looked at the, the prevalence in that. Um, and uh, we mentioned um, in the intro that I run a, a specialist clinic for, uh, oh, whoops, we're missing a slide there, a specialist clinic for Charles Bonnet syndrome. So in the people that get referred to me 
also have inherited retinal um, dystrophies and the whole range of, uh, of these kind of genetic retinal problems. And so I see people with Usher syndrome, various types of retinitis pigmentosa with various gene defects and other kind of genetic retinal dystrophies. And it's partly defined a little bit by the, my proximity to Moorfield. So if you're attending the genetic clinics there, then you're likely to be sent on to me if you've got Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now, one of the really important new things in this area is that as we're studying um, inherited and genetic retinal dystrophies, we're realizing you can get Charles Bonnet syndrome in children. So I've got a bit of a delay on my slide advance here. Hang on, let me go back. Here we go. Um, so this is a study from Moorfields um, that's just um, come out in 2020, uh, looking at, at the, the, the um, uh, just some ca a case series of Charles Bonnet syndrome, exactly the same types of phenomena that I've just been talking about, but in children. Now I'm just going to pause here because this is a really important change in the way we're thinking about Charles Bonnet syndrome, because the, the original definition of Charles Bonnet syndrome from the 1930s was supposed to celebrate Bonnet's original description of his grandfather. So you remember Lulin was in his 80s or whatever. So the, the way Charles Bonnet syndrome has been used for many years is to, um, to describe people, um, elderly people, with, without any kind of dementia or cognitive impairment who have visual hallucinations and, we, and eye disease. And, and we now realize that actually it doesn't really matter um, what your age is and that you are at risk of having um, Charles Bonnet syndrome uh, even as a child. And so this is where the genetic retinal dystrophies come in because you are just as, as much at, at risk of it as um, older people. Um, there is a bit of a debate as to whether the prevalence might be different in, in younger compared to older, uh, but from that Netherlands study, I think they had 8% of their star guards who were all young, young people. Um, and so that's not that different to the, the elderly population where I said it's between 10 and 20. So as we learn more, we might say, well, there's a little bit less of a risk if you're younger. But how it looks at the moment is that the, they're not that different. And uh, the, the age isn't a, as big a factor as we perhaps thought it was. So I'm going to whiz through the top 10 uh, Charles Bonnet syndrome hallucinations as we see them in the clinical uh, world today. Um, so this is kind of looking at a population of people with Charles Bonnet syndrome and see what, what, what their most common ones are. And the top one is simple hallucinations, um, lines, dots, colors, um, speckles of light and, and so forth, so forth, the simple shapes uh, about, um, 90% of people with Charles Bonnet syndrome will also have some sort of geometrical pattern, like the brickwork we heard about, or lattice work, or chain link fencing, chicken wires are sometimes also used. Uh, a surprising one, not mentioned by Ludin actually, is a disembodied face. And the face um, is often distorted in some way, so that it gives the appearance of being like a gargoyle or grotesque in some way. So called a monster or something like that prominent eyes or twisted features. Uh, then we go on to the figures. And uh, this is what I was referring to um, in, in Lulian's description of, of uh, the, the figures being in costume that was contemporary for him. People still see the same types of figures in these elaborate costumes, often wearing hats. Um, it, can be, it can be knights in shining armor or roundheads and cavaliers or all those kind of Ed, Edwardian dress or, or um, uh, or the, the sort of 18th century dress. Um, this is a very typical thing. It's not in everyone, but it's a very typical description. And, and the, um, the figures are often seen as small. So they might be described as children um, or this word Lilliputian figures from Gulliver's Travels. They're very tiny little figures. And it may depend a little bit upon where you see the figures. So if you see it on a surface that's very close to you, you might see it as tiny. And if you see it far away, uh, you might see it as giant. Um, next one, text and letter strings. So people often see what looks like um, a sentence or a, a few words or a newspaper print. Uh, but when you, uh, when you try to focus your attention on it and look at it, 
it doesn't make any sense. And there are people who, um, instead of seeing letters, will see musical notation. So that's crotchets and quavers and staves and, and um, sharp signs and all this kind of stuff. Um, and, and so even if you're not musically qualified or, or a, a, a you know, trained musician, you can still see musical notation. And, and again, for those that are qualified, they say it doesn't really make musical sense. It's just the kind of essence of, of the, um, the letters and things. Uh, these random dot patterns, um, uh, little sparkles and, and, and what we call today snow or snowstorms, visual snow. And then right at the bottom, about 20% of people are still seeing vehicles. So Lulin saw carriages. Today it might be a bus or a, um, a train uh, or a lorry or something like this. Um, uh, so, so vehicles do seem to be a very characteristic type of um, object. Now, I wanted to say something about retinal uh, dystrophy, so inherited retinal diseases. And uh, we haven't really looked at this in any great detail, but I will say two things. Most of the people that come to me with a retinal dystrophy, so that's retinitis pigmentosa or one of these other genetic ones, they have this kind of visual snow thing and um, they will describe it in different ways. Uh, but it's, it's like this little dots and things covering everything that they look at or in, in the, the corner of their eyes um, on everything. Now that you don't get that. It was quite far down the list in, in my um, survey, which was predominantly age-related macular degeneration. So I think there's something special about these uh, little dots, which are also sometimes called phosphenes. And there's also something special about the moon, because lots of people that I've seen with retinitis pigmentosa will always describe a bright silvery moon or a bright silvery shape, a crescent moon or something. It might be there all the time, it might come and go and it might move around. And again, I never hear that in people with uh, macular, age-related macular degeneration. So we don't know what, what, special, what these symptoms actually mean, but they may be special to people with uh, retinal dystrophies, inherited retinal dystrophies. So let's look at the time course of uh, a, a typical day in someone that has Charles Bonnet syndrome. So I've, uh, I, for those of you who can see, I've got a, a 24 hours on, on uh, a timeline here and the hallucinations occur around this time, late afternoon, early evening, Often when you're um, relaxed, maybe listening to the radio, not very do not doing very much. That's when that's the, the Charles Bonnet syndrome time of the day, if you like. So I imagine if there's anyone on the call that has them, it would be now that you're going to be getting them. Um, now, it's not all like that. Some people have them in little episodes throughout the day and they, they, they tend to last a few seconds, maybe a few minutes um, uh, in, in a typical case. But there's some people who are unlucky and they have hallucinations, particularly those, um, the visual snow type things or the lights and colors and things. Um, they have it from the moment they wake up in the morning to the moment they go to sleep at night. Um, the typical story of when it starts is that if you suddenly lose your vision, uh, then the hallucinations are likely to start in the weeks or, or days even after you've lost your vision. And they will be really bad for the first few weeks and months, and then they gradually uh, get better over time. Now, I should say that, that it's not like that for inherited retinal disease, because you don't necessarily have a day when you wake up and you've had suddenly a loss of vision. Um, it's a more gradual thing. And so for people with these uh, more slowly progressive retinal, um, uh, inherited retinal problems, uh, it's, it's when you reach a certain level of visual loss, that they start. So it's not necessarily a sudden thing that you would notice, oh, it's, it's linked to my vision. Also important to say, it doesn't have to be both eyes. It could just be one eye. So if you have one eye that's really bad, you're still at risk of having Charles Bonnet syndrome. Now we used to say that, oh, it, it, it's a, it, you know, visual hallucinations in eye disease will get better over time. And, and in about two years, you'll be fine, they'll be gone. And unfortunately, we now know that's not true because we did a big survey um, of about 400 people with Charles Bonnet syndrome. And we asked them, how long has it gone on for? And um, more than 75% had had them for at least five years. So we know from that fact, of course, it can't be that they all get better within uh, two years. But now I, I don't want to, um, give a negative message here, because this is not to say that they haven't improved in some way. So the hallucinations are still there, but that means that they may occur very briefly, once every month or maybe once every year. Um, you still get them, but um, 
they haven't gone away totally. And so you could say in a way that they've got better, but that but not in the sense that you'll never have another Charles Bonnet syndrome hallucination. Now, here's an important slide because it tells us about the um, uh, the, the proportion of people that find it uh, troubling. And uh, about two thirds of people with Charles Bonnet syndrome, once they know what it is, once they know it's not a sign of mental illness or if you're older, if you, you, you're getting an early kind of um, memory problems and dementia, once you know that, then you're not really that bothered by your Charles Bonnet syndrome. So a really important thing to say is that it's only about a third of people where we can see Charles Bonnet syndrome as what you might think of as a clinical condition, something that needs doctors or help or medication or, or whatever it is. For, for most uh, people, you can think of it as a normal response of the brain. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So it's not a clinical problem for everyone. And I just want to point out here, because we'll come back to this later, that what we really want to do when we're treating Charles Bonnet syndrome is not necessarily a total cure and say, oh, the hallucinations will go away, you'll never have another one. But what we, all we want to do is, oh, I've lost my animation. Uh, no, there we go. Um, all we want to do is push people from um, the ones where they're distressing, they are um, unpleasant, they want them to stop, to the group where I don't really mind about my Charles Bonnet syndrome. So if we can get everyone to I don't mind about it, then that's a cure of sorts. At least it's, it's helping people um, without necessarily having to make all the hallucinations go away. So we looked at what factors make Charles Bonnet syndrome really bad for someone? What is it that makes it intolerable and that you need to go and see a doctor and get further help? So um, one of the things is fairly obvious, it's how, how frequently it occurs. So if you're having it every few minutes, you can imagine that's gonna be more distressing than once a day or once a month. And also how long it lasts. So if it's there for a whole, uh, uh, several hours a day, that's gonna be much more difficult than if it's only there for a few seconds. So those are kind of slightly obvious ones that you probably could have guessed. Um, also um, important is how intrusive they are. So if the hallucinations uh, make you um, or interfere with you going to sleep or watching the television or trying to read that little bit of text on, on your um, instructions or whatever it is that you're using your CCTV magnifier or your, your visual low vision aids and you can almost see the thing but the hallucinations getting in the way and that obviously is a, is a problem that makes it distressing for you. Um, and the Perhaps a slightly less obvious one is what you knew about Charles Bonnet syndrome when you had your first hallucination. So we know that if you already knew about Charles Bonnet syndrome and that you were at risk of having it, that you, you're less likely to get these really bad distressing outcomes. Whereas if you'd never heard of it, if it's all news to you, and you have your first hallucination and then you, your work, you're struggling to find information about it, you don't know what's going on, you assume you've got a serious mental illness, obviously that's going to be more distressing. So uh, forewarning is a really important um, uh, um, attribute or aspect of, of um, avoiding these very difficult to treat or distressing unpleasant hallucinations. Right, I'm going to move on to a little bit about the science behind it. What, how does eye disease actually cause Charles Bonnet syndrome? And the theory comes from, uh, for those of you who can see the portrait, this is a man called uh, David Kogan. He's, he's a, an American neuroophthalmologist, and he comes up with a theory that it's not problems in the eye itself that's generating the hallucinations. It's, it's loss of visual information coming from the eyes to the back of the brain, which is where all our visual processing takes place. When you lose that information, then there are uh, changes in the brain, in the activity there. So in, in terms of, um, I'm gonna use some neurophysiological terms here. So that's how the brain cells are firing. And um, we know that if the, the cells um, become hyper excitable, um, whoops, uh, sorry, I got, confusing my animation. So if, if the brains become um, super sensitive and fire off when they shouldn't do, um, uh, that's, that's what's likely to cause the, the Charles Bonnet syndrome. And, and the, the way that the, um, the cells become sensitive like that is because of the, the loss of 
of input from the eyes. Now we showed that this was the case um, uh, over 20 years ago now, coming up to 25 years ago, using brain scanning uh, techniques. So we had some volunteers with Charles Bonnet syndrome that, and in fact, um, a couple of them had retinitis pigmentosa. Um, and they came and lay in the, on our brain scanner and we asked them to tell us when they had hallucinations. So nothing was happening. They had their eyes open, I think. They were looking, um, uh, or, or um, you know, they could see the scan itself, but there's nothing changing in their visual world. And yet they have a hallucination and, and bits of their visual brain light up when they have the hallucination. And the, we found that the bit of the brain that lights up when you uh, hallucinate a face is that bit of the brain that we use normally to process faces. So when we see an, a face in the world outside us, a bit of our brain is processing that. And if you get this spontaneous, excitable activity in that bit of the brain, you can have a hallucination of a face. And similarly, if it's in the color area, you'll have a hallucination of a, of a colored blob. Um, so this helps explain uh, what's going on in Charles Bonnet syndrome to a degree. So we know that this 10% um, uh, of people who uh, have a who are susceptible to having Charles Bonnet syndrome, if you've got moderate visual loss, or maybe more if you've got severe visual loss, we know they have this super sensitivity in visual parts of the brain. And for those of you who can see, I've got a, a slice of the visual cortex here showing activity in the brain um, to eye movements, actually, and, and uh, showing some uh, the red areas of this super sensitive response in people with Charles Bonnet syndrome. And we also know that if you don't have Charles Bonnet syndrome, this 80% of people with moderate visual loss or, or perhaps 40% with, with more severe visual loss, those people um, don't have this super sensitivity. Now, uh, what we don't know is what causes that difference. And we, um, we think that it's something to do with how the brain has responded to loss of visual input from the eye. So there's some difference in wiring as the brain adjusts to this visual change. Um, it's uh, different in some people that leads to this hypersensitive visual cortex and in other people's it doesn't and that's what defines the um, the Charles Bonnet syndrome risk. Now whether that's controlled by genetics or whether it's something you were born with or something that you that, that some other factor that we don't yet know about those are things we don't really yet know so all we know at the moment is what's going on when you have the the, the Charles Bonnet syndrome but not really why only some people get it. OK, um, I just wanted to say uh, something about uh, the world's biggest uh, experiment in social isolation that we've all just gone through, the, the COVID uh, lockdowns, uh, because through this, we have been able to learn a little bit about how other factors make Charles Bonnet syndrome worse, and in particular, social isolation and stress. So this was a study uh, that was carried out again by Moorfields, who um, canvassed people with Charles Bonnet syndrome, and, and they showed that um, during lockdown, visual hallucinations did get worse. Um, the, uh, the, the, the way they got worse was obviously a change in content, perhaps a little change in frequency. Uh, but I have to say there was no people who um, had eye, visual loss who, because of lockdown, started their first Charles Bonnet syndrome hallucination. So you didn't develop Charles Bonnet. It's just if you already had it, it, it changed or, or got slightly worse. And we sort of knew already that stressful situations um, makes the, the Charles Bonnet syndrome flare up, if you like. Uh, but the COVID epidemic um, and the lockdowns really have confirmed this for us in a way that, you know, we could never have done an experiment locking up people and seeing, well, does your Charles Bonnet syndrome get worse? Um, uh, the, that's, you know, that's the, um, uh, what COVID did for us, if you like. OK, now for the final part of my talk, I'm going to just talk about treatment, because this is an important thing that we all want to to know about. And uh, I was um, led a, a study um, looking at older people, I have to say, um, but looking at hallucinations across a whole different range of conditions. So that's Parkinson's disease, eye disease and, and dementia and trying to come up with some a consensus view as to how we should treat these in all of these conditions and hopefully learn from each other. So my, maybe we can learn something in eye disease from the way people with um, Parkinson's get their hallucinations treated. So uh, this is a, 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 a study that where we all sat together in a room and came up with these consensus guidelines 
uh, as to how to treat hallucinations. And I'm just going to go through this in a little bit of detail. So this is this is something that everyone should know. Um, it's not necessarily just for the healthcare professionals on the call. Um, it's it's for um, you know people with visual loss themselves need to know this. And and part of the reason for doing these sorts of webinars is to raise awareness about these factors that that if if we can um, uh, you know help spread the message, then that will reduce a lot of the, the problems caused by Charles Bonnet syndrome. So on my um, algorithm here, this is, so I'm, uh, for those of you who can't see, I'll describe it, but we start at the top and it, we start treatment for Charles Bonnet syndrome even before the hallucinations have started. And what that means is that you really should be warned in your eye clinic when you are diagnosed with a, um, an eye condition that's gonna put you at risk, you really should be warned that this is a possibility that might occur. And if that was that simple sentence that you wouldn't even dwell on at the time, that might protect you from having bad outcomes later. Um, but uh, what we're talking about here is really um, the next step. Oh yes, I just wanted to say that that, that is really evidence um, in, that comes from the, the idea that if you're forewarned about hallucinations, that reduces this risk of negative outcomes. So that's why we, we put that into the the algorithm. Um, now, everyone that develops hallucinations, they should have a series of things to, to go through um, or to think about. And I'm just going to go through those in a little bit more detail. So everyone should have a physical health review. So in other words, somebody, somebody needs to think that you haven't got an infection or some other medical problem that might be causing this. And somebody needs to think if you're older, not if you're younger, but if you're older, somebody needs to think about have you got early memory problems? And somebody needs to make sure that your vision is as good as it can be. So that means optimizing your vision from if they, you've not got a treatable condition, then it, then it's, you know, visual aids. And, and um, if there's something treatable, ophthalmological intervention. Um, so that's an important thing uh, to think about. Then there's medication review. So you might be someone who's taking medication for other things, and those medications might be making the hallucinations worse. So somebody needs to think about that. That could be your GP, it could be uh, your eye doctor, it could be uh, any of the doctors looking after you. And again, um, some of these aren't going to be relevant to younger people, like urinary incontinence medication. Um, but some of you might be on um, certain types of antidepressants or uh, ulcer medication. So these are all things that we know can trigger visual hallucinations. And so it may be it's just simply uh, changing that medication to something else might be all that you need. And then person-centered therapy. So, so we need to tailor our treatment to, to, to you, basically. And so that's about giving out as much information as we can. And all the charities have uh, fact sheets and information sheets, et cetera. Um, the, uh, there are lots of them available. And they, they all say roughly the same thing. I mean, there, there are no sort of different uh, pieces of advice out there. Um, and then there are support groups. So um, Esme's Umbrella is trying to set up these Esme rooms where people can go and, and, and like have peer support other people with Charles Bonnet syndrome. Macular Society has them. So there are things out there, but you need to be signposted to them so that you can access that kind of support. And you also need to be taught how to stop hallucination. So if you remember, long hallucinations are more distressing. So if you can make them shorter and, and sort of being able to interrupt them, then that's, that's something you should be taught how to do. Now, there are um, uh, ways of doing this using eye movements or perhaps changing the lighting. If you're in a very dim environment, making it brighter. Um, general alerting strategies. So if you're sitting down doing nothing or just listening to the radio or something, getting up and, and walking around or doing something different or social interactions, these are all sort of things that can break a hallucination as it's occurring. It will come back later but it gives you some control over it. And, and if it's a particularly difficult time, then you, know, you, you, you feel that you have some control, you're not being ruled by your hallucinations. So that's a, a good thing to be able to do. Um, and then, so that's, that is really something that everyone, those three things uh, or three elements are things that everyone should, should know about and be able to do. And that, that's really for, uh, you don't need to be a medical professional for that. It's, it's all um, eye care professionals should know all of that. And if, um, people with visual impairment themselves knew about it, then, then there's a lot of self-help and, and, and treatment available out there. Um, I just want to say a few words about the negative, distressing hallucinations, the unpleasant ones, what I call the clinical problem, because 
I think there's a really important message from this talk uh, that I wanted to share with you. Um, and, oh, maybe I'm missing the slide, hang on. Okay, um, but, but that is that, that there are, uh, there are treatments for Charles Borneo syndrome. That's a really important message because we used to say to people, well, um, there isn't really any treatment, but, but there, is tr there are lots of treatments out there. Um, it's just that not everyone needs the treatment. Uh, so uh, in terms of people distressing hallucinations, there are these um, talking therapies that are, that are available. And um, the, uh, the last um, kind of, place that we can, the, the last mainstay of treatment would be going, moving to medication. So this is medication actually to treat the hallucinations. And uh, there are three types of medication uh, or four types, um, uh, four types of treatment, three types of medication. Uh, medication that's used to treat epilepsy um, because that dampens down this hyperexcitability. Um, medication that actually is used to treat dementia. Now, um, even if you're a young person, no chance of any dementia, um, these work because they act on a brain chemical that's actually used in vision. And a sort of side effect of the medication is then that you, you can improve the Charles Bonnet syndrome. Uh, there are certain types of antidepressants that work on this brain chemical called serotonin. That's also been shown to be effective. And brain, so this is a new kind of research technique that I'm going to just show at the end here, brain stimulation. So we can use a, a very small, very weak electrical current on the scalp that goes through onto the visual parts of the brain and dampens down the activity. And we've just shown that that can, it doesn't totally stop hallucinations, but it improves them uh, in um, uh, people that both have continuous hallucinations and people that have uh, intermittent ones. So uh, occasion, you know, episodes of hallucinations, which then reduce in frequency. So this is a, a kind of experimental treatment that it may be um, the way that uh, ultimately we'll be treating Charles Bonnet syndrome with people having this piece of equipment in their homes and being able to put it on themselves and sort of giving themselves a top up of uh, brain um, stimulation to reduce excitability in their cortex once a week or something like that. And that would mean you don't have to take any medication, but that's, these are experimental things for the future. Uh, but all I can say today is that the, the trial that we ran in Newcastle and also uh, with myself in, in London ha has uh, shown some success. So I'm going to end there. I hope I've um, given you a sort of um, uh, an introduction to the man himself, to Charles Bonnet, and, and a, a flavour of um, the, the types of treatments out there and, and the positive message that there are lots of things we can all do to treat Charles Bonnet syndrome. And with that, I'm going to thank you and hand back to Matthew, if I can. Thank you, Dominic. Um, so yeah, that was absolutely fantastic, wonderful presentation. Um, in fact, I'm gonna get my colleague Denise to, uh, to come to the screen. Um, we've had a number of questions that have come through. Uh, so if you have any other questions and you'd like to ask them, please do um, pop them in the Q&A section. And again, if you'd like to ask your question in person, you're, perf you know, pos you're more than welcome to do so. Um, so you can either raise your hand via the reactions on a tablet, um, by pressing Alt and Y on a Windows computer or Option and Y if you're on a Mac computer. So across to Denise. Thanks, Matt. Thanks very much, Dominic. It's really interesting. Uh, we have had some questions come through online. Um, the first one is, are the hallucinations ever of people the sufferer knows, such as friends or family members or even people who have passed away? So um, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, the answer is not usually. So a very um, interesting observation is that people don't usually recognize the, um, the, the figures that they see. Now that's not to say it never happens, but it's unusual. And um, a, an important sort of consequence of me saying that is that these are not memories uh, that we're kind of re-experiencing, so visual experiences that you've had in the past that you, you that are reawakened by the Charles Bonnet syndrome. They're more like the way the brain processes seeing figures and they're kind of um, templates of, of what, we, what the visual brain means by a figure, not of a specific person. So the simple answer is it's not usual, but it can happen. That's great, thank you. 
Um, the next question, is there any understanding or research done on people whose sight has gradually deteriorated over time uh, to having as little, uh, as little as light perception? Um, that they're experiencing CBS. So we talked to you talked about sort of people experiencing, you know, sort of 60% loss of sight, but someone who's actually gone much further and it's it's light perception only that they have left, but the person still feels as though they experience CBS, or is it is it more likely that the brain is just filling in details that they've experienced previously? So it's a super long question and a great question. Um, so we so there is this idea that as you gradually lost vision, you your CBS would would go away. Um, and that that is not we now know that's not true. As I've showed you the evidence there, it's it's not necessarily the case that your um, Charles Bonnet syndrome uh, gets better over time. And in fact, it can get worse. And so that's the same for someone that's got very gradual visual loss or someone that's got a very uh, a sudden visual loss. Um, but I would say as, as a, a kind of an aside, that we do know that when people lose all vision, so total loss of vision, um, you can be divided into two groups. So one group of people forget how, what it was like to see. So they do lose visual experiences, they lose their visual dreams, they would no longer have visual dreams, and they, they still dream, but the dreams become more tactile or um, auditory. Um, and then there's another set of people who even though they are entirely visually impaired, have no perception of light, they use vision all the time. And what they're using is imagery to maneuver around the room. They, they, have, a, they have a very strong visual sense of the world um, and, and they use that in their day-to-day -day experiences and, and maneuvering, you know, they visualize where things are and, and they use that as a sort of tool. Now, we don't know why there are these different groups of people um, and we don't know whether those two map in some way onto whether your Charles Bonnet syndrome gets better or not. I, I, that's a very interesting research question that we don't yet know. Lovely, thank you. Um, can you expand on ocular pers pers persever persever oh, my, my teeth won't work this today, perseveration, um, what symptoms would be expected with this? So again, that was on. That was a very um, astute whoever spotted that. So that was on my list of symptoms. And so what you experience is you're looking at something and you move your eyes and the, the thing remains stuck where you're looking. So you, you're still seeing it wherever you're moving your eyes. And um, it's usually thought of as a, a quite a, a neurological brain symptom. Um, but we found that lots of people with, with Charles Bonnet syndrome were reporting it. And um, uh, the, the, uh, it, it's just on the list of symptoms, it's about halfway down, about 45% of people uh, reported it. And um, we, it's something to do with the, um, the, 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 I guess the brain uh, holding on to that bit of information as you're, losing, as you're moving your eyes or, or not use, doing the usual thing of um, knowing that you've moved your eyes and therefore you must be looking at something different. So we don't know, we don't understand it in eye disease, but it's there. Thank you. Can CBS potentially happen with all eye conditions or are there conditions where CBS is never triggered that you've come across? So that's so that's an excellent uh, question again. And um, so any eye condition where you get loss of vision. So, of course, you can go to your eye, um, you can go to your ophthalmologist because you've got problems with your tear ducts or, you know, you, there's, there's, those are eye conditions, but they're not causing visual loss. Um, so they wouldn't cause Charles Bonnet syndrome, but anything where you where you can't see as well. And it's important to to for me to say as well that uh, some some eye diseases like glaucoma um, and and even the early stages of retinitis pigmentosa, where you can still see in, in you know, you've got your tunnel, but you can still see straight ahead and probably you can see quite well on the chart going down the, um, uh, you know, in your eye test. Your eye, So your chart view is not so bad and yet you're still at risk of having Charles Bonnet syndrome and it's because you've lost the uh, the periphery of your vision rather than the central bit so but any eye problem that any retinal problem any problem that's causing this significant degree of, of visual loss 
um, will put you at risk of Charles Bonnet syndrome. And we have never come across one where you haven't. So you'll find case reports of every eye disease. I mean, obviously, it's, there are lots of new genetic ones that, that um, people are only just discovering now. So we don't know that yet. But I, I, my guess would be that any eye problem, and I can, also, I can also reassure you that's the case, because someone who hasn't got visual loss, who's blindfolded for two weeks, will also start to develop Charles Bonnet syndrome. So uh, it's any kind of functional loss of input to the visual parts of the brain that will lead to the hallucinations. So that I think probably answers another question that's come through. Can children born with no sight have the condition? Uh, so this is, um, it doesn't answer it, I'm afraid. Ah, um, okay. This is a, a very important philosophical, Bonnet would have loved this question because it speaks to the, um, the question as to whether the brain that's never been exposed to light uh, can still have visual experiences. And I've got a sort of fudge answer to it. So I do know that there are people who um, lose their vision in the first few days of, you know, after being born, whether through their, their eyes are removed for whatever reason. Um, so they really haven't had a lot of um, exposure of their, the visual parts of their brain to light, but they have had a tiny little bit. Um, and those, so, but those people can have Charles Bonnet syndrome. So there's a, a relatively famous case of a man like that who, um, uh, in his later years, in his 60s, developed, had a stroke of the visual parts of his brain and then saw those uh, geometrical patterns, brickwork and um, lattices. So he could draw them. Um, and so he clearly had Charles Bonnet syndrome, even though he'd never seen. So that's, a, that's a, an answer there. But you could say to me, well, he did see for two days or whatever. So how do we really know? So the, the, it remains a debated point as to whether um, if you've never really seen, if you were born without eyes, could you have Charles Bonnet syndrome? Um, and it's, I would love to be able to answer that for you, but we don't know. Thanks, Dominic. Um, someone's asked, if someone wants the brain stimulation therapy, who would they ask to be referred to for this? So the, the trial um, was, was carried out in uh, Newcastle and London, as I said, the trial is now finished, but we are trying to uh, offer it on the NHS as a specialist treatment. So uh, perhaps that person could email um, uh, Retina UK and, and put them in contact with me and I can, I, I can tell them what, what we would need to do. But it is a kind of case by case experimental treatment because it's not, this, this brain simulation is not licensed for Charles Bonnet syndrome. We've, we, you know, we've just done the one case report, but it, um, or the one study, uh, but it is something that on, on compassionate grounds, we are allowed to offer it because uh, we know it can be helpful. That's lovely, thank you. We have had an inquiry previously on um, our helpline uh, quite recently and um, asking that somebody had heard about a Chinese medicine um, therapy that was supposed to help Charles Bonnet syndrome. Is that something you've ever heard of? Yes, um, it, there are these, um, it's, it's available in Japan and it's, it's a Chinese traditional medicine and it's called Yi Gan San. Um, I, I apologize if I pronounce that incorrectly. I don't know what the correct pronunciation is. Um, but we, so we did try, um, I've had a number of um, uh, people, patients um, who have got it on the internet. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure if it's available in the UK. I think you can go to your Chinese herbalist and show them the thing and they'll know what it is, et cetera. Um, and, but I have to say that the, um, it didn't particularly, it, I don't think there were any side effects, but it didn't particularly help the person that, that tried it. So um, again, I can, um, I can email those details to the um, uh, Retina UK and you can pass those on. But the, I, I'm not sure how available it is in the UK. I think it had to be sent over from America or, or somewhere else. I, I can't remember. This was a couple of years ago now. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you, Dominic. Matt, I think you mentioned somebody had their hand up. We do. We have uh, Dr. Sana Ahmed. So, uh, Dr. Ahmed, I'm just going to ask you to um, to unmute yourself, and uh, you can ask your question. See if the technology is going to work for us this evening. No, we will come back to that one in a little while. Um, We've got anything else in the list, Denise? Um, just have a look. 
Hello. Oh, oh. there we go. Hi, Hi apologies. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Hi, great. Thank you so much uh, to everybody for organising this talk and Dominic has been really interesting to hear. I, it was more a comment really than a question. Um, I am 32 years uh, of age now and I have RP myself. Um, and I have to say, I have struggled to kind of, and it's all been research that I've been doing myself to investigate, you know, what is this thing that I'm sort of seeing? And I have to say, you know, everything you're saying is is very, very important. And if there are any healthcare providers on this call, because um, I'm seen at Moorfield, and I remember many years back, going back to 2012, uh, 2012, where I have been sort of describing these symptoms of um, visual snow, you've just been saying, and it was after most of the doctors were saying, no, no, it's got nothing to do with RP, or, or they just didn't know about it at all until I finally came across one doctor who mentioned to me CBS and then that's where I've been kind of doing my research so that point that you were saying about you know letting patients know and giving them the heads up nobody had ever said to me that you know you could develop CBS is quite likely and this is what it looks like even despite me sort of going to more fields on several occasions uh, you know across the years and saying this is what I'm noticing and it doesn't I'm not sure what it is which was also quite worrying as well um, so so that's uh, something that I, I wanted to to just say really as, as a comment. Yeah, that's an excellent point. And, and I hope that things are moving on and that more fields is, is pretty, would be better now. I hope that if you were to present now at more fields that you would have a better experience and you'll be signposted to, to help earlier on. So it would have saved you a lot of internet searching and angst, I guess, if, if you'd have been told right at the beginning. Um, but the, the snow thing is an interesting one because that's kind of really just new to, we're only just recognizing that now. So maybe they wouldn't have even told you that uh, if you go to now, as it were, or in the, in the recent past, um, but certainly they, they hopefully would have told you that you would have been at risk of, of having things like that. Yeah, well, I mean, as I said, they didn't talk about um, potential risks of CBS or uh, of any um, shape or form. So it very much is just my lived experience. And then me constantly going back and talking about it and, and then realizing, yep, this is visual snow. And like I said, it was after me seeing several doctors. Um, there was one who uh, a female doctor who mentioned CBS. And, and then it's, it's really been a self-discovery um, journey, I would say, where I have been looking into it and come across um, Esme's umbrella and so forth. So, yeah, I hope so, too, because um, it, it's, uh, it, it's just much more stressful and confusing. Um, and I think demotivating and moralizing as well when you're constantly going to your doctors and explaining this is what is going on. And, and when you see that the doctors are trying to say, nope, it's got nothing to do with your with your vision which, you know, even if there are plenty of doctors who may not know about this, but, um, you know, it's, it's highly likely and kind of understandable um, that the two would be linked, even if you've not come across um, CBS. So, yeah, that's just what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thank you. We do have a couple more questions, um, but I'm not sure whether, Matt, have we got time for one more or should we cover these perhaps um, with, with Professor Fitch separately and email the responses out? Yeah, we will. We, we've, uh, we have unfortunately come to the end of our hour. Um, we, uh, we do have some other questions and, um, and Professor Fitch has very kindly offered to, um, to answer those. So we will, um, we will follow those up with um, those who have asked asked questions um so so dominic thank you ever so much for taking your time um to spend the evening with us um it's been so insightful i've learned a huge amount um so thank you um thank you very very much for your uh, your support on this uh, webinar um so if you or one of your service users are experiencing charles bonnie syndrome and would like some further support you can contact the Retina UK helpline. Uh, you can either call 0300 or email helpline at retinauk.org.uk. 
So as an extension to our helpline, Retin UK do offer people who are struggling with visual hallucinations the opportunity to speak with uh, one of our volunteers who's also experienced CBS um, to gain some peer support. Um, and again, you can contact our helpline um, to access this service. So as mentioned at the beginning of the evening session, we are planning to deliver at least one webinar um, every month. And over the coming months, we have topics covering how to get involved in practical activity, uh, practical physical activity, um, Stargardt disease, uh, medical imaging and Usher syndrome. And there'll be many, many more um, as the year progresses. Um, so this is just a gentle reminder that Ret in the UK is a registered charity. Uh, we receive no government funding and rely on our wonderful supporters, such as yourselves, um, to raise the funds needed to provide our vital services and to invest in groundbreaking medical research. Uh, there are some great ways that you can support us uh, during 2022. Uh, you could challenge yourself to run, walk or cycle in one of the many um, events we have taking place throughout the UK. Our fundraising team is here to help you with expert support and guidance, um, as well as offering places in prestigious events such as the London Marathon, the Great North Run and Ride London. So you can visit retinauk.org.uk forward slash 2022 for some more information. Or you could fundraise uh, with your colleagues at work or ask your employer about selecting Retin UK as organisation charity of the year. Um, so you can email um, our fundraising team, so that's fundraising at retinuk.org.uk to find out some more, or call the team on 01280-821-334. So after, the, um, after this wonderful event this evening, uh, we will be sending an email out um, over the next couple of days, which will have details of where you can re-watch the presentation uh, by Dominic this evening, um, and how you can also book onto our other events. Uh, we will also be seeking feedback from you um, on this evening's session, um, and we do really do rely on your feedback to ensure that we are uh, pitching at the right level and so we can develop our webinars and services further. So once again, thank you ever so much to Dominic, thank you to Denise for joining us, um, and thank you everybody for, uh, for joining us this evening. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.